Welcome back to our next video in this series. In the last video, we discussed some of the background details of the first letter of Peter. Now we will proceed to study 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 to 12 a bit more intensely. We will look at each verse and the words and try to make meaning out of it. Then to see how does it relate to our lives. Isn't it? We do Bible study in order to understand what did the Spirit of the Lord speak through His apostles, through his saints, to that time's original readers and audience. And how does that message connect to us today so that we can live our life? As I told in our introductory video last time, stand firm is the general motive by which Peter is writing this letter to these believers who are scattered across the northern part of the Asia Minor. But right in the beginning when he is trying to encourage them to stand firm even in the difficult times, when their faith is challenged, when their life is threatened, when their properties are confiscated, when their own dear and near ones have become anti or hostile to them just because they believed in Jesus and they are unwilling to participate in the emperor cult that was becoming a very fast growing religion in the northern part of the Asia Minor. There comes an important thing right from the beginning that Peter, the apostle of Christ Jesus, wants to put it into their mind very clearly. He wants to tell them, my friends, Stand firm in this grace that you have received. But remember, it is because you are positioned with a purpose since eternity. You need to stand firm in this grace that you have received in Christ Jesus. But remember, this standing firm is necessary because God has a very clear purpose in putting you in the place where you should be. And this he had done in eternity. He saw you even before you decided to follow Christ Jesus. God has a purpose. And that purpose is fulfilled through your life. Only when you learn to stand firm in what you have received from God. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 12, we will focus on the theme, positioned with a purpose since eternity. So stand firm. Let us now come to chapter 1, verse 1. In chapter 1, verse 1, Peter introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, in the study of the epistles, Often, these kind of introductory words which mentions the sender, in this case Peter, the receiver to whom it is written, like the believers who are scattered in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, and these solemn words of blessings. Like in verse 2, towards the end he says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now whenever in the beginning of a letter, these three elements are put together, we call it as epistolary greetings or salutation. Now that was the common practice in the ancient days. In modern times, when we write letter, we say, My dear father, dear papa, dear mama, and then we say, praise the Lord. And then we go ahead with our greetings and our best wishes for them. And then we come to the point for which we are writing. Now, Peter is also following a very common practice of the Greco-Roman world, where he begins his letter like anybody else of the Greco-Roman world to introduce himself that who is sending 
to whom is he sending and then the words of blessings so this is called epistolary greeting or salutation now look at peter how is he introducing himself he says peter an apostle of jesus christ when you read an apostle of jesus christ it strikes our mind you know why because that is the way peter wants to be known not only to be known that is the way peter is understanding himself if you ask peter peter who are you he has nothing else to say than to say that i am the apostle who is an apostle we know it very well that apostle is the one who is sent out on a mission by a superior person in the hierarchy of the power so the one who is sent out as an apostle into the world or for a purpose into a far land with a particular mission is actually allowed to function on behalf of the superior authority in that particular place he is authorized to do that so what is peter trying to say peter is saying i am the apostle of jesus christ i am the one who is sent out by jesus christ to function on behalf of him and as part of that is sending out and the sense of responsibility that peter has that he thinks it is all right as a suffering apostle in the prison of rome that he can write a letter to these persecuted christians who are scattered across the northern part of the asia minor and to strengthen them to encourage them to stand firm in their faith and to tell them that god has positioned them with a purpose since eternity how does he introduce jesus who is this jesus jesus is christ why in the new testament studies christ or christos in greek has often been understood as a name of jesus the man who walked on the shores of galilee the man who pre-existed with god and incarnated in human form in the modern times many have argued that a better and accurate form of understanding the word christ when it appears along with the name jesus is to understand it as a title that is connected with his name jesus if so the term christ or christos in greek is a messianic royal kingly title which means he saying that i am an apostle of jesus the king of jesus the king who has sent you peter jesus who is the king has sent me and i function on his behalf in this world that's why i am writing this letter to you i have the authority you are called out once in the name of jesus christ and he has sent me so i have the right to send you the letter then he moves on to speak about the audience themselves for whom he is sending this letter our focus to study positioned with purpose since eternity starts from the very words of greetings by the apostle peter note carefully in your bible peter addresses his readers or audience as god's elect exiles as mentioned in our background discussion they are scattered throughout the provinces of pontus galatia cappadocia asia and bithania while peter is sending the letter to them so peter is in prison he is writing to a persecuted group of christians who are scattered but then he wants to make it very clear to them that you are not a simple person you may be 
scattered but then remember one thing that you are god's elect let us try to understand these two words they are the elect of god the word elect that peter uses here belongs to the group of election words in the old testament it explains the special status of israel among the nations and her unique status before god why is israel special among all the nations because god has elected them for his purpose there are other words underlining the fact of election used by peter in the letter for example he uses another word chosen he speaks about new birth in chapter 2 he speaks about the they are the treasured possession now these all words together make it very clear for his audience that peter is trying to tell them that your existence as a christian or your incorporation into the body of christ the community of god is not accidental it is not something that is happening just like that but it is by god's election they all together speak about the salvation of peter's audience in jesus christ it points to an underlying fact that they are co-opted into a new reality that is now they are chosen by god the other election word which he uses in chapter 1 verse 2 chosen peter wants his gentile readers to understand that they were in the plan and purpose of god even before they believed in christ jesus they were seen by god in eternity isn't it wonderful for peter's audience to hear this oh i believe it should be how wonderful it would be to know that while the world rejects us while the world is hostile towards us for nothing but because of our faith in christ jesus that we are reminded that god has seen you even before you have known him god has seen you in eternity and he elected you and he called you out by name to involve you into his work to fulfill his plan his will and his purpose in this world they must have been overwhelmed with joy knowing that they are not accidentally into this faith there is nothing for them to be suspicious about their decision that they have taken to follow Christ Jesus but they can be moving forward confidently because they are the elect ones of god peter wants them to understand how and when they were elected by the triune god let's read chapter 1 verse 2 who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of god the father through the sanctifying work of the spirit to be obedient to jesus christ and sprinkled with his blood this is an amazing insight that right in the beginning that peter is trying to put into their mind you are the elect ones of god god has a purpose with which he has positioned you in a particular place so stand firm in your faith but remember this is a perfectly coordinated effort of the triune god god the father the son and the holy spirit all are equally involved in making sure that you who did not know him before you who were not part of the great promise that he had given to abraham you who were living a hostile life to god's standards were actually determined to be redeemed from the sinful life god the father peter says they have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of god the father in chapter 1 verse 2 
in 1 3 that is chapter 1 verse 3 the father is specifically mentioned as God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ so Trinity is in the mind of Peter for knowledge when he says he is referring back to God's omniscience in what we call in our Indian uh, languages or especially in Hindi he for trikal darshi hai he is the one who knows everything he sees past present and future at a time thereby his ability to see the past present and future at the same glance at one time gives him the knowledge about the future about which we are ignorant but God knows it what is he trying to tell them to a persecuted group of Christians that your election onwards your persecuted state at present is not an accident or a tragedy that was not known to God Everything that happens in your life was actually foreknown by God. And because of that, you have every reason to stand firm. Because nothing will happen to you without the knowledge and the approval of God. He has become your protector. You will be guarded. He knows everything that is happening to you the second thing you are elected by the work of the spirit what kind of work it is a sanctifying work of the spirit that means in your election the holy spirit is actually actively working in you to perfect you in that election so that you are able to connect with God in his mission and fulfill his plans and purposes that he has for you. God, the Spirit, is actively working in your life to sanctify you, to purify you, to cleanse you of all the worldly corruptions. And if they were Gentiles, who came from a Gentile background into faith, then as Peter would say in chapter 1 verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty ways of life handed down to you from your ancestors. This is a very Jewish way of saying about the corrupt form of life, unethical, immoral lifestyle of the Gentiles. He says, it is the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. You were engrossed in that sin, in that emptiness of life, into that form of life which your ancestors have shown. But now, when God has foreseen you and he has foreknown you and he has elected you, co-opted you to be the part of his group of people, to belong to him Holy Spirit is continuously at work in you to purify you to cleanse you to perfect you to make you holy the sanctification process that happens in a believer's life is only to give us greater shine to be in the glorious presence of God and the third you are saved by the blood of Jesus. The third person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, is mentioned with a special reference to his blood. You are saved by the sprinkling of his blood. It is a cultic term well known in the Levitical temple tradition where an animal is offered in the temple for the ramification of human sins. The blood of the animal is offered at the altar and sprinkled upon the sinner for the forgiveness of sins. 
borrowing that levitical tradition language from the levitical tradition and the rituals that take place in the temple jewish temple to declare forgiveness of sins peter is saying that is the same thing that has happened in the shedding of the blood of jesus upon the cross that he was by shedding his blood declaring you holy and making you his people he was bringing forgiveness to you but why are they elected by the sacrificial death of jesus and the sanctifying work of the spirit in the foreknowledge of god the father what is the purpose the purpose of your election the purpose why you are positioned with purpose since eternity is to be obedient to jesus christ chapter 1 verse 2 to be obedient to jesus christ that the triune god became one in will and in action to save you the goal is that you become obedient to jesus christ his teachings his gospel stand firm god has a purpose since eternity and you need to stand firm in obedience to fulfill that now let us fix our eyes on the next word exiles the idea of exiles usefully captures the current state of peter's original readers as something more than a temporal resident alien status the greek term parepidemos meaning exiles signifies their separation from the world through divine election and their historical state of being landless dependent and dislocated in every sense this word in the ancient world was time and again used for a civil servant distinguished by his exemplary conduct while on an international duty they are scattered now the word actually captures both the spiritual and the historical reality of their life while many in the past said elect and exiles are two different realities we can very well believe from the text that both are actually two sides of the same coin they are not two different realities the word elect qualifies their condition as exiles they are exiles in the world historically because they had to run away from their own hometown their own villages to an unknown far place and stay as exiles in different cities but at the same time they are exiles because they do not belong to this world god has made them the citizens of the heavenly kingdom so while on the earth they are spiritually exiles so both spiritually and historically they are exiles but while they are exiles in this world the reality is that they are the elect ones some of the translations when you read you will find that elect is followed by a comma and exiles is used sometimes people have by doing this have tried to put these two separately but we do not need to do that because in original language in greek because there is no definite article there you can always treat elect as the adjective which defines or qualifies the word exile so that means you are exiles in the present but at the same time you are the elect ones of god you are historically exiles you are spiritually exiles but in both states you are actually the elect ones of god this means that now they have a new identity by the divine act of election in christ jesus by the sanctifying work of the holy spirit this leads us to the next vital discussion on peter's take on the present adversities of life 
and the eternal hope of the eternally elect people of God in chapter 1 verses 3 to 12. While in chapter 1 verse 2, Peter says that it is by the foreknowledge of God that they are elected. In chapter 1 verse 3, Peter says, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Similarly, the death of the Son, Jesus Christ, alluded in chapter 1 verse 2 by his blood that he says, it is compounded by the reality of his resurrection from the dead in verse 3. So he died by shedding his blood, but he rose up from the dead. It was God's foreknowledge by which you were elected. Now it is the mercy of God. You did not deserve it, but the God who is merciful has shown mercy upon you in electing you and making you his people. And then to give you a living hope. In short, the living hope of the people of God is now worked out by the victory of the Son over death through his resurrection. The great offer of living hope is by the great mercy of God. It is no man's goodness that has ensured that they are saved, they are elected but it is the mercy of God. It is quite Jewish to speak this way about God. Now notice verse 3. One is not brought into living hope, but are given new birth. Jesus in John chapter 3 speaks about the spiritual reality of the same kind as rebirth. Or in our Christian spiritual jargon, born again. Living hope is a beginning of a new life by new birth. It is like their past physical birth, but this time in Christ, it is spiritual in nature and new in form. Now, we ask, one is born into what? Look at verse 4. Referring to an eschatological, unperishable hope of new birth in Christ, Peter is saying, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. In short, it will neither lose its shine and glory, neither it will become corrupt, nor it will ever cease to exist. It will be always there. It will never perish. It will never get corrupted. It will never be spoiled. And never it will lose its glory. And it will never fade away. So you are brought into this living hope. It is a new birth. That oh believers of Christ Jesus. Fellow brothers in Christ Jesus. Who are now in a dangerous situation living in a hostile world. In chapter 1 verse 4, again he says, the inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Who keeps safe your inheritance in heaven? Verse 5 says, that in the last day when the Messiah will come, it will be there for you. It is this day which is the day of salvation. Until then, by the power of God, they are shielded by God's power. What a great reason for the Petrine believers to hear from the Apostle to stand firm in their faith. They need to stand firm because God has positioned them with a purpose since eternity. And their reward is safe in the custody of God, the Father. The most reliable, the most dependable and the most powerful God of our inheritance. No one can steal from him. He cannot lose it. Neither can someone destroy what is in his custody. 
Isn't it quite heartening for the Gentile believers who are persecuted and are disappointed, discouraged, disillusioned to hear that whatever may happen in this world to them, tomorrow, beyond this world, on the other side of this world, there is the Heavenly Father who has kept their inheritance secure and it will be given to them at the right time. Remember, you are positioned with a purpose since eternity to eternity. Hence, stand firm today. Wherever you are, let 2021 be the year to remember the message of Peter to face unknown challenges. We have not seen, but nothing will happen to us in this year that is not known by God. Hence, in verse 6, speaking about the present day struggle and comparing with them with the future living hope of glory, Peter says, it is this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. They are persecuted now. These are trials. But these moments of grief, pain and sorrow will vanish away when there will be the return of the Messiah and the reward will be given to you. You will rejoice in it. You will rejoice in it. And all the pain of the present you will forget in the future. Because God is the one who has called you into the living hope. The present suffering has an eternal purpose in the plan of God. In chapter 1 verse 7, Peter says, These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in what? Praise glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Many a times we think pain and sorrows are not part of Christian life and God has no purpose. Those are the moments when we get discouraged about our sufferings. We become so disillusioned. When people oppose us for our faith, we get scared and we are afraid of bearing testimony for Jesus Christ. But Peter is telling to this persecuted group of Christians, a minority scattered across the Asia Minor region that all this is happening in order that it may bring praise, glory and honor to Jesus Christ when he will be revealed. How wonderful. How wonderful is that pain that we bear today for the sake of Christ that will have eternal consequence. The joy of his readers in the present suffering is without seeing him but loving him. He is very clear that you have not seen him, but you love him. You have believed in him even without seeing him. So Peter says, you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your soul. You have not seen him and you have not known him, but you love him. You believe in him. The net result of your this unconditional love the net result of your love for this God who has died for you upon the cross, who has shed his blood for you and God the Father who has seen you in eternity is that your souls are being saved. Your new birth into this living hope that God has kept for you is actually the salvation of your soul. It is Peter's parallel words to Paul's Famous expression, justification by faith. You live today in that living hope for tomorrow. And you will receive the salvation of the soul in future. Is exactly what in Paul's language is justification by faith. It is the theological fulcrum point of the Protestant theologians and reformers like Martin Luther. And that is the gospel for us. Finally, in chapter 1, verses 10 to 12, Peter involves in explaining the greatness of the salvation they receive by faith in Christ Jesus. It is twofold. Prophets have spoken about it, knowing that it is for you. So when you hear the gospel now, or you have heard the gospel two months back, four months back, one year back, three years back, remember, even in the Old Testament times, prophets 
when they spoke of these promises and the coming of the Messiah and his death and all those details, when the prophets were prophesying by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they knew it very well that it is not for them, but it is for you. Secondly, even angels have longed to see these glorious things of salvation that you are now possessing. Chapter 1, verse 12. So even in the past, prophets who became the messengers of God, who spoke this great promise and the hope of message that they were preaching, they knew that it is not for them, it is for you today. On the other side, angels are also waiting, longing to see this, which is now disclosed to you and which has now become the part of your experience. How glorious is your salvation? Concerning this salvation, he says in detail, the prophets have spoken, so their salvation is not accidental and sudden, but quite well thought through and spoken, declared and repeatedly affirmed a reality in the past. Secondly, the Holy Spirit, that is the Spirit of Christ, working in the prophets, was revealing this great truth in their prophetic words regarding the suffering of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Please read chapter 1, verse 11. Hence, the prophets knew that the glorious salvation is for you in the future and not for them at that time. In verse 10, Peter says, They searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time of circumstances. They searched intently and they knew it is not for them. Peter says, This ancient and great message of salvation is now proclaimed to you by those who are prompted by the Holy Spirit spoken to you. Notice that the Holy Spirit has been in the business of God and the Son to work out your salvation from eternity to eternity. The three persons of the triune Godhead are one in their will, purpose and goal for the salvation of the fallen humankind. They are dead in sins, but by new birth they are wrought into the chosen people of God, kept in the world by the grace and mercy of God for the living hope of salvation through the sacrificial death of the Son and the sanctifying and the charismatic function of the Holy Spirit. What does it give us? What will be the takeaway for us from chapter 1, verses 1 to 12? The takeaways are, number one, you are eternally seen and positioned with purpose by God, the Father, in His eternal foreknowledge. Even living in 2021, let us be assured that God has seen us in eternity. So our 2021 is not beyond God's knowledge. You are not an accident in the world and neither anything that happens in your life, a good or a bad thing, is not luck. But it is the fulfillment of the purpose of God. It is something that is happening by the foreknowledge of God. Instead, both in your suffering and in your rejoicing, God has a clear purpose. So, stand firm. Number two, the triune God has acted in perfect oneness of will, plan and purpose to save you. The three were active in the past to plan your salvation by the Father's foreknowledge, in the present to save you by the Son's blood, and the Spirit's sanctifying work. So what has started in eternity will continue into eternity so that you who are living in 2021 may be the one who will be found in that living hope of tomorrow. Number three, the salvation is exclusively divine offer for you. Your hope is imperishable and eternal. It is secure in the hands of God, the Father. Number four, present suffering is momentary, giving way to the future hope. The glory of the living hope is incomparable to your present suffering. Number five, and the last, remember, you are saved 
to be obedient to Jesus Christ who died for your salvation. Stand firm because you are positioned with a purpose since eternity to be found in eternity. God has a plan for you and 2021 is secure in the hand of God. Your future and my future is in his hands. Let us rest in peace and stand firm in our faith. God will do the rest. May the Lord bless us through these words.